in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Toback, and I'm going to be talking about how I would hack you today. Thank you so much to Santa Claus for inviting me to the North Pole. I'm very excited to be here at KringleCon. So let's get started. When you think of a hacker trying to infiltrate a system, are you thinking of something like this? Maybe a person hacking under the cover of darkness, maybe they even have a hoodie on or something like that. Or do you think of something like this? A person smiling, maybe calling to confirm the receipt of an email, talking to you over the phone. It turns out that the majority of cyber attacks now start with some sort of human element. And this is actually how I got my start as well. I got my start in the social engineering capture the flag at DEF CON, where I was actually a winner for the last three years. And what we do is we hack companies live over the phone, and those companies do not know we're calling. But we're not malicious. We don't actually gain access to their systems. We simulate how we would get access by getting them to go to fake malicious URLs. And this is an example of what a social engineer might do to try and get access to your machines, systems, or data. So we're all aware that these types of scams exist. Why is it that we still fall for them if we know that they're out there? The reason that we still fall for these types of scams is because social engineers are exploiting principles of persuasion that you can't switch off. They're natural parts of who you are and it's just a part of your personality or your human behavior. So if you wanna know more about how these principles of persuasion work, you can read about them in Robert Cialdini's book, Influence. We'll walk through them here. The first one is reciprocity. We feel a sense of indebtedness to people who tell information about themselves. So if you tell me information about yourself, it's really likely that I will share key pieces about what I do or who I am. An example of this is if I were to come right up to you and say something along the lines of, what operating system do you use? You would probably not want to answer that question because I haven't shared anything about myself yet and it's very awkward to ask a question like that to a person. But if I come up to you and I'm at my computer and I'm really stressed out and I'm like, I have this talk coming up for KringleCon and I cannot figure out how to share my screen. I think it's because I'm on an old operating system. I don't know what my problem is and I know nothing about Macs. Does anyone here have a Mac? Now somebody is willing probably to say, I have a Mac, right? Because we can all see that. But then five minutes down the line, when you're helping me with my computer, it's more likely at that point that you might start talking about what version you're using of your operating system. And that, those little pieces of information I can use to piece together to be able to gain access to your machine later down the line. The next one is commitment and consistency. We have to make thousands of choices every single day. And we don't wanna make one choice and then the next and then the next, that would be extremely inefficient. So what we do instead is we make a choice and then we apply that logic to any other choices that would make sense. A social engineer knows that if you start giving them information, it's really likely that you're going to continue giving that information. So for instance, I don't come right out and ask you what version of your antivirus software you use, even though that's what I'm going for. Instead, I might start with a softball question, how your commute was today? Do you have any pets? If I hear, maybe I play a uh, sound of a barking dog in the background of my uh, call while I'm calling you, if I hear that you have a barking dog in the background of yours and we start that type of conversation. Now, 25 minutes down the line, you don't wanna stop and say, I'm sorry, who are you again? Because people don't like to feel irrational. So you commit and are consistent to your previous choices because you don't want to live in a world where you've been giving this malicious person information for the past 30 minutes on the phone, in person, or for the, the past five emails. The next one we have here is social proof. People tend to trust people that are in large groups, their coworkers, their friends, their bosses. A social engineer knows that if they can name drop people that you trust, then you're more likely to comply as well because you don't want to be left out of the crowd. So an example of this is if I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna probably look up who your friends are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And if I have those names, I'll just work them seamlessly into the conversation. 
So I might say something along the lines of, oh, hey, Jason, I'm so happy that we got to talk today. Ed has told me so much about you. And if I have those little pieces of information, the right names, it's really likely that you're to give me the right information. The next one we have here is liking. We tend to trust people that we like and we like people who are similar to us. So as you can see in this, people are mimicking their hand motions back and forth. And this type of mimicking of hand motions is something that humans just naturally find trustworthy. So a lot of times we either mimic hand motions, voice tone, phrases, the way we speak, our intonation. Those little key factors help us understand that we're similar to each other and we can trust each other. So what I do before I call and actually vish my targets, I look up videos of how they sound. I try and find what their voice sounds like, their phrases, how high their voice is, how low their voice is, and I try and imitate that on the call. I don't want to do it too obviously because then they'll be kind of on to me, but I try and just work it in seamlessly. The next one we have here is authority. We trust people who sound like they know what they're doing. And this is really simple. In general, when I am going onto a vishing call, I choose a pretty high status pretext. That's who I'm pretending to be. So I'm not gonna usually call and pretend to be an intern who's confused and scared, but rather I'm gonna call as someone's boss's boss's boss, someone they've heard of but not talked to personally. Now keep in mind, I have done successful calls from low status pretext, but if you wanna go in with a pretty surefire bet pretext, authority is usually the right way to go. The next one we have here is scarcity. So this one's kind of sneaky. We tend to trust things that are put in front of us under a sense of urgency simply because we don't have time to think about whether or not we should answer those questions, give that information, or something like that. So if I were to come right up to you and say, hey, can you go to this link for me? And we're just sitting there at work. You'd be like, mm, I don't know. That doesn't sound like the right thing to do. I have been told before that that's not the right thing to do. But if instead I say something along the lines of, Hey, I'm so sorry. I'm actually on the runway right now. I'm sorry. It's really loud. Um, I, I have to make sure my talk link works before I get there. Can you hear me? Can you go to www.maliciousurl.com? Did you get that? Maliciousurl.com? Now, in that scenario, it's way more likely that you're just going to type in that malicious URL because you want to help me, you want to be kind, and I've created a real sense of urgency. So you don't have any time to actually think and wait and say, that doesn't sound right. So now that we've gone over these Cialdini principles of persuasion, watch this video of a hacker breaking into somebody's account in two minutes, and then think about which Cialdini principles of persuasion you're seeing there, and we'll talk about them. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of phishing call? What's phishing? Phishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Okay. You, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider and okay. see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my... <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for Eustace information, and I can't remember what email address we used to log the account. The baby's crying. Um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh. I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. 
Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. Set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry. So there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her set after this. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Holy so they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. So that happened pretty fast. Let's walk through what we saw there. The first thing that we saw in that call was social proof. She had the person's name, right? So she was able to impersonate the girlfriend um, and go through the call like that. The other thing that she did that you might not have realized is that she was spoofing the phone number um, to make it present like she was calling from that actual person's phone number. We can do this, uh, it takes about uh, 10 to 15 seconds to set up and it's pretty easy to do online, but that's a different talk. The next one we saw there was liking. She was really kind, she was not demanding, um, and she had the baby crying in the background, which made her feel likable. She also name dropped a lot of information about herself and her partner that made her seem relatable, information about being alone and things like that. The other thing that you saw there was authority, and this one was really sneaky. If you remember, she said, see, I'm not going to be able to get a secure pin because I'm on the phone with you right now. That's actually not true right? But she convinced somebody who works at a cell phone provider that that is how it works. She actually convinced them of that just because she had that authority in her tone. The next one we saw there was urgency. And this one was really sneaky as well. She actually created an outside force that was acting upon her. So she had this bad guy, right? Her husband, I guess you could say, um, who was telling her that she had to apply and get this information done by today and she had these two crying babies. We then feel bad for her because she has this entire outside force acting upon her under a sense of urgency, so she is made to act quickly. We think it's not possible for her to be the bad guy because she's got this other force acting upon her, so we try and help. The baby crying is also a fantastic sense of urgency in and of itself. So before we actually get on these calls and we actually uh, do these pretexts and talk to people, social engineers are using social media to prep. We also use things like Maltigo to understand about our targets um, and make sure that we have clear pretexts. But in general, what I need to hack a company in about 10 minutes or less, I use Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, things like that. And in fact, 60% of the information that I need to hack you is actually found on Instagram alone. And this is because of two things. First, geolocation tagging, and second, workstation photos. So a lot of pictures that we take at work, we take because it's our anniversary or we have a birthday cake from our coworkers and we wanna show off how much we love our work and our job. But what's in the background of that photo? In the background of that photo is a workstation that's open and I can see all of the software and possibly guess which versions of that software you're running just by looking at the outdated logos or icons. I can also see the schema that you use on your folders for naming and different conventions that you use on your computer. And having those little bits of information help me reliably pose as an insider because you know IT support has access to your machine so I could reliably pose as somebody in IT support, for example. I would never be able to see these photos or understand what your computer has on it if you didn't take a picture of it and tag it to your work. It would probably be hidden and I wouldn't find that you work there unless you tagged at that specific location on Instagram. So what I go through is I look through all the addresses on Instagram by using the places area on Instagram and then find all of the addresses and find all of the photos from there. That's one example of how we use social media. There's many other examples, and we spend about 150 hours, at least I do, before I get on a call to make sure it's seamless. So let's walk through a social engineering chain so you can see everything that we talked about step by step by step. So the first thing I'm looking to do is attack your company. Let's say I've been commissioned to do a vishing attack on your company to see how far I can get. So I am looking to find information about, uh, let's say I'm looking for the end game of your antivirus. I would like to know the version of that, but I need to do a lot of steps beforehand. So I go on Instagram and I find a geotagged Instagram computer photo and right there in the tray, I see it. 
the semantic icon down there in that bottom tray. And I'm really excited about it because it looks a little bit outdated, which is fantastic for me. So let's walk through what I do. I need to call as IT support to confirm that you actually have semantic and that specific version. I'm thinking it's 4.2 with a lot of known vulnerabilities, which is gonna be great because then I can tailor my malware to avoid detection on your machine. So I need to call and reliably pose as IT support. If I'm calling a large company, I'll pick somebody who's in IT support who's female because I can reliably pose as that person. But if it's a smaller company, I might need to pose as a vendor because you probably know everybody in IT support. So that's kind of how I select who I'm pretending to be. So I'm gonna call and say something along the lines of, hey, this is Allie. Um, we just had Daniel call me and say that there are a couple of different machines that were acting weird on the network. Um, and we think it might, might be because you have an outdated um, semantic. Uh, do you have antivirus software on your computer? You see that little yellow shield? Okay, if you could just right click on that for me and see if it's version 4.2. If it is, you're good to go. Um, if it's not, then we'll wanna update to 4.2 for you. Okay, you see that? All right, great, thanks. So that's how fast it happens. Once I know that you have that specific version of that antivirus with known vulnerabilities on your computer, I will tailor my malware to avoid detection on your machine and send the exploit. So that sounds really scary. A lot of people think, well, how could I possibly defend against that? There are many ways that you can keep yourself safe. So how to defend against social engineering, the first thing that I always say is be politely paranoid. You don't have to be rude to people. You don't have to hang up on every single person that calls you, though I usually do. But if somebody calls you and they pretend to be someone that you're just not sure about, you just wanna make sure you use what I like to call real world two-factor authentication. So if somebody calls you, uh, email them back if you already have an email for them. And if they call you, they might be spoofing a phone number. So you can just say, hey, I'm stepping into a meeting. Can I give you a call back? They know they're probably burned at that point because you're going to give a call back to that number. And it's not going to go to the criminal. It's going to go to the actual person's number. And they're not going to have any idea about what they quote unquote called you about. The other thing to think about is it's really important to talk to client facing staff about this because when I go and try and attack a company, the first people I go after are not what people always think. A lot of people think my first attack vector is gonna to be to go through customer support. But in general, I go through finance, hiring managers, recruiters. A lot of times it's kind of the softer targets, the folks that don't expect an attack to come. Customer support is really well trained and so they're likely to shut me down. So it's important to talk to everybody who's client facing, anyone who would reliably pick up a phone, process an invoice, talk to anybody from the outside world. For example, an office manager collects packages and really understands the ins and outs of your company. I would likely go after that person first before customer support. So those folks need to be trained too. The last thing is two-factor authentication, the technical kind, is really essential to keep yourself safe. It's important to train your humans, but human beings are fallible. And our point with training is never to get to zero click-through rate because it's just impossible, right? You're get, people are going to make mistakes. And so we need to have those technical backups to make sure that we can keep folks safe. So having two-factor enables you to make sure that a hacker cannot get into your account if they do have access to it through other means. Another thing that you can install is a password manager for everybody at your company, your friends, or your parents, or whoever else that you know and love. That way, if they go to a fake URL, something that's going to be malicious, the password manager won't recognize that as authentic and won't input your password. That's another really good way to protect yourself against hackers like myself and actual real life criminals. So many people say that humans are are actually your weakest link, but I completely disagree. I think when humans understand what happens, they can actually be your first line of defense to protect